the stream has ended. You're no longer live. Good. This was a very quick session for us. Let's try again. So for me, it says you're live and recording. Yeah. There's a red hmm. dot and it says live. But it was green a little while back. Now it's become red. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> oh. Let's try again. Okay, fantastic. Excellent. So hello, everyone. And welcome to our panel on uh, making machine smarter, um, AI in the use of Industry 4.0. I would like to thank my uh, panelists from uh, all over the world that join us uh, in this session and are uh, going to have a, a lively conversation. Um, I'll start by introducing the topic and myself. Um, I'm uh, Tomer Solovich. I'm a global head of uh, business development and sales at the Razor Lab. I've uh, been 20 years in the industry and uh, across a variety of different technologies, artificial intelligence and the like, and happened to join uh, an amazing company and talk about artificial intelligence uh, for the last few years and the impact it's doing on both humans and machines. We are excited to have this panel with this uh, magnificent group, uh, really to challenge some of those aspects and, and the basics element uh, of um, the Industry 4.0 revolution and really how we move it forward. I would like to start by uh, introducing uh, some of my members here. To, uh, to talk and introduce themselves. Uh, Sanka, you want to start? Hi, my name is Shank Som. Uh, I'm the Chief uh, Innovation Evangelist uh, TCS. Uh, so what do I do in TCS? So I sit between research and innovation uh, and the rest of our business and customers and markets and create a two-way channel to push insights uh, back from the market into the research process and also advocate research and innovation to our customers. In addition to that, I also uh, uh, manage marketing, branding, insights and foresights uh, for corporate research and innovation. Uh, I've been with TCS for 20 years and I am based in a city in the middle of India, which is called Hyderabad. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Tomer. Back to you. Thank you, Sanka. Uh, Mikael? Thanks, uh, Mika Dorgan. I'm heading one of our corporate research center within ABB in Sweden, actually one of the born town of ABB. Uh, the center is more than 100 years, so doesn't mean that we don't work with future technology because that is all about. But ABB is one of the leader in automation business where we are quite heavy in process industry, in the robotics manufacturing industry and for sure electrification and motion business so it's a huge company with a lot of interest in the ai field thank you um chris please hi so i'm chris mcdonald i am the head i uh, head of ai and analytics for ppc um so fundamentally ppc our tagline is digital transform physical so we create um, a portfolio of digital offerings and solutions that help industrial customers um, engineer, design, manufacture, and service um, industrial equipment. So I think about um, the AI and analytics capabilities, in particular applied AI and analytics that help our products get smarter and our customers um, get better insights. Thank you. And Christian. Hey, Thomas. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Christian Hocken. I'm with the Industry 4.0 Maturity Center. Uh, we're supporting manufacturers to embark the journey towards digital, so building data-driven organizations. Um, yeah, typical customers are, um, are larger organizations that are looking for industry 4.0 strategies worldwide, and uh, we are following that very closely over the past 10 years. And what we see recently is that there's really a shift towards um, AI. So uh, after working on uh, building interfaces and uh, removing uh, silos of, for the past decade, we are really up for the next chapter. That's really exciting. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to where we are heading. Uh, thanks for having me again. And back to you, Toma. Excellent. Thank you. So just to frame the conversation, when we talk about making machines smarter, we want to cover today a little bit about the innovation and how does it play a key role in transforming the industry itself into a more sustainable, productive, and safe place? And how do we use data and accelerate operations? How do we transform heavy machinery into smart devices? And we're going to talk and cover multiple different segments 
across the industry itself. So let's start with, um, with kind of the first question, and, and I'll, I'll kind of direct it into uh, probably Chris on when we talk about AI and why having uh, why is AI having such an impact in the area of uh, the fourth uh, industrial revolution and what are kind of the segments and sectors uh, that are most impacted, if you want to take it from here. Yeah, so I think um, when I think about, you know, AI, um, I take it from a, a very much a human computer symbiosis, you know, side of things and practical application of it. So mm. and the, the, the two areas that it impacts most, um, you know, through our work at PPC is really in manufacturing operations or in service of you know industrial equipment out in the field. And I think the the business goals have always remained the same, right? Manufacturers want to produce high quality goods, you know, on time. They want to minimize costs, right? And they want to meet um, on the service side SLAs and provide a better customer service, proactive service for their customers. So those goals remain the same. It's really about how AI has transformed um, the ability to meet those goals, right? And create a competitive advantage for those goals. So in the case of say, you know, operations, right? It's it's really the practical ability now that we have things like IoT and digitization, we have all of this data that's that's far greater about our equipment and about our operations. And when you give physical devices a voice, right? It really comes down to the ability to listen. And when you have tremendous amounts of data, humans can't on their own process all of that data to drive meaning and insight. So AI is really about leveraging computational abilities to augment human understanding of an operation or a piece of equipment. So if I can better understand what's happening and ideally proactively about what's going to affect the quality of my product, I can take actions to prevent an adverse event. If I can understand about my asset in the field, how a customer is using it, um, and have a remote connection to that product and derive insights about a maintenance event, right? I can mm -hmm. proactively service or get my customer to service a piece of equipment. So it's really about giving um, understanding from the voice that's been given to the physical world through sensorization um, and through the, the amassing of lots of data from different systems, um, you know, including service records um, and including IoT devices. Makes sense. Mikael, any thoughts on this? Uh, I think I fully agree what you said, but for me, AI is pure, purely a tool, actually, that will increase the speed of transformation. Because I think what we are going towards is to make the manufacturing more and more autonomous. Mm -hmm. And you will have different speed and different level where you will reach in the operation for sure. But it's we have to remember it's just a tool that we got a new tool in the toolbox and we need to use it where it makes sense. As uh, you said earlier here, that is, we, if we cannot prove that we improve the uh, yield, quality, efficiency, and flexibility in the manufacturing, it doesn't make sense. So that is always the to be on the top of the mind. What's the value creation of utilizing it? So that's the, the important, most important thing for me. Thank you very much. Sanka, what do you think? How do you define what AI, um, but basically artificial intelligence really means uh, in a few words? Uh, I know everyone is talking about the same thing, but it means different things. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic question because, uh, uh, see, if you really think about it, there is no accurate definition of human intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, here we are trying to define artificial intelligence. But to me, uh, artificial intelligence is a class of technologies uh, and I think I'll uh, you know I fully agree with Chris there because uh, I think the core uh, the core characteristics of these technologies as is that they improve the human ability to sense understand and respond to our environments better uh, and uh, I, th I think that's the most important part because uh, without a human in between, uh, I think we should not try and make an interpretation of AI. Uh, and uh, uh, and I'm, I'm very excited about, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 some very interesting emerging use cases uh, that I see. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll give some examples from other sectors as well, right? Of course, uh, yep. uh, while we talk about, uh, you know, industrial and manufacturing, uh, but um, I'm very excited about the uh, you know, the coming together of people uh, of uh, process and physical mm -hmm. assets uh, in, uh, you know, in, in this new construct that we call enterprise digital twins, uh, which is essentially 
uh, focusing on collaboration between these three different types mm. uh, of, uh, I would say, AI enabled, uh, enabled uh, uh, you know, assets uh, and trying to improve the, uh, the points of interactions where people interact with process and where process interacts with assets and so on, right? So uh, there are some very few, uh, you know, uh, some very good examples of that and maybe I'll touch upon them uh, in the rest of the session. But uh, I think I'm really excited about that, that how, a, you know, the, the class of AI technologies is working at this confluence mm -hmm. of uh, people, uh, machines and process. Mm -hmm. And how do you, how you guys think about, uh, how do you feel that, you know, customer react? the actual implementation of AI when they're, uh, you know, starting to get aware of it? Um, customer reactions to AI? Yeah. So, so, I'll, so I'll maybe point out to two things, right? The first is, I think, uh, uh, a lot of TCSS customers, and, you know, we operate across 15 uh, different verticals globally. Uh, I think there is a general impatience about AI, and people think that AI is a magic bullet. Uh, they think that you deploy AI, and... You know, the, some of the, uh, you know, some of the most common questions we get is, hey, you know, we bought, we, you know, we invested in a lot of AI. When do we start seeing results? Uh, and I think it's very important to uh, sort of, uh, you know, drive home the point uh, that uh, there are two special characteristics about AI, right? The first that any large AI deployment uh, is a large change management exercise, right? Uh, and, and we shouldn't forget that. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, and I think that is also what people forget, is that, uh, uh, any AI deployment is a large experiment done at scale, right? So the iterative bit of it, uh, I think mm -hmm. a lot of executives uh, don't understand that because they're familiar with software 1.0, which is, you know, the older generation of software where you deploy something and it works. Whereas, uh, you know, people forget that, uh, you know, a, a learning system actually takes several years of deployment for it to start delivering value. And I think that is the main, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think, friction between... Uh, you know, expectation and where reality is uh, that, mm -hmm. you know, people expect results too soon from AI. Yeah. And I think with AI implementation, it's a, it's one of those interesting um, you know, factors where there's a ton of inertia and excitement and, and over promise with simultaneous resistance to the people who actually have to own and take responsibility or consume those insights at the same time. So I couldn't agree more. Change management is critical, right? And I think if you don't get Cross organizational support, domain experts, IT experts, and you know vendors or providers who are bringing this in against a use case that has executive support from the beginning. No one likes something that's you know thrust in what they do, and they you know were thinking they were doing well, right? As a say, an operator in a manufacturing plant, and I think it's really critical for how you implement a technology, whether it's to drive automation or to drive better decision making that that operator, that you're giving them an insight in the least disruptive way. So the best AI is the AI you don't know is there. The more you notice it, right, <laughs> the, the, the worse it's going to be. So it has to, you have to empower people, enable them to make data-driven decisions without having to sift through data, right? So you want to meet them at the point of highest impact. You want that insight to arrive in the operator's hand in a way that he can trust and he can make a decision on. And you want him involved from the start, right? rather than enforced yeah. upon them. So it's a it's a collective change management that has to happen. I, I think yes, in addition to that, I think one of the things, if you're utilizing AI into critical components in the manufacturing plant, you are not allowed to fail because that can be a disaster. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those people want to have a sort of explainable AI. It should not only be a black box. You need to understand why it reacts and how, and it needs to be trustworthy. So I think those are the two things that customer, when they start to dig into it, it's easier to implement a little bit outside the core of the manufacturing, but when you go into the core, then mm, it yes. really needs to be robust. That's correct. Um, yeah. I, I the, wor the worst time for an executive to figure yeah. out like how it, how AI can be expensive when done wrong is like when he learns about a false positive and the expense of false positives from machine learning when he's interrupting his operation. Like that's the worst time to learn about that concept. <laughs> correct. <laughs> I, I want to take the question to Christian and a question from an immaturity perspective. You know, and you're dealing with multiple different industries on a maturity level. And kind of wh where do you see it? What segments and activities mostly affected? And you feel AI is really impactful uh, from your kind of wide range of uh, 
Yeah. And so yeah, yeah. So what we saw across the or during the last years that is that more and more things come together. So equipment is getting connected, is getting smart, and you actually end up using those data. And what I see uh, over the past years is that this is actually understandable by people, even by engineers. Yeah. So they they, they know what is happening in the bed and and the back, and they see how that helps you. Now, when you are entering into AI, that changes a little because. Uh, uh, with the very advanced AI um, cases, um, as an en engineer or as, as an operator, you don't actually understand what is happening there because there is so much happening uh, in the in the back, and that is really interesting. So the um, the the uh, the change management concepts we need here are completely different. Yeah, it's it, it we still need to explain people that. Uh, uh, even in the future, they will be there, yeah. And this is more like meant to be a recommender system or like a su supportive system, and this is really interesting. However, what we see is that we are entering into fields that are uh, getting, um, yeah, uh, really interesting, where we can get back uh, back value that we wouldn't get with with classical digital approaches. Yeah? Mm -hmm. One example is dynamic process controls. So mm -hmm. in process industry, very complex processes with dozens of parameters can be controlled with the help of AI and the clients we are working with, they are, I mean, they are, most of them are still in an early phase, but they see already the success in this. Yeah? So mm -hmm. they see that when operators are following the recommendations of the system, is that uh, the, the, the performance turns out to be much better than even when an uh, experienced operator used to run the process. Yeah? And that's, mm -hmm. I think, really interesting. I think that's fantastic. Go ahead, Sanka. So I, I just wanted to add a uh, one point. See, this whole notion of explainability, right, is yeah. is a very interesting notion. And I uh, I think rather than trying to make uh, AI fully explainable, I think a better strategy is to use this technique called counterfactuals, right? Where mm -hmm. uh, you know, where you sit with an operator and you say, hey, if you change this component beyond this threshold, the decision or the classification changes. And I think that, uh, see, because it's about, you know, rather than, you know, uh, trying to explain uh, to, uh, you know, an operator on the, on, on the floor, uh, the intricacies of a very complex system, I think uh, trying to make that person understand that how based on the inputs, the classification or the output actually changes uh, is, is the most human way of somebody uh, understand something, right? Because as kids, we were also, <laughs> you know, made, made, to, <laughs> made to learn that way, right? That if you do this, that happens, yeah. right? So I, I think yeah. counterfactuals is a great way to uh, improve uh, the acceptability of AI, uh, especially yeah. in environments where, uh, you know, where, where people don't have a very uh, 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 sort of a very de deep understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one of the things that I always say is that unless you're just using regressions, right, the minute you get into neural nets or convolutional neural nets, they're literally called convoluted. So explaining yeah. them is going to be near, you know, near impossible. But it, to me, a lot of, like you said, just factual understanding, understanding context, working with the operators as that change management process. A lot of AI goes back to the to understanding the power of statistical thinking. You have to get a human operator who's likely done this for a very long time to understand that yes, his instincts are probably right, but the power of statistics is to, to overcome the human limitation of we overestimate what we think we know and we underestimate the role of chance. So if we can combine the power of statistical thinking through computational abilities of AI, we can augment a human's basic limitations, not you as an operator, but that's the reason many companies are using AI is to just to, to fight that basic human limitation. Correct. So when you look at the entire process and implementation of AI across various different customers, right, will be interesting to learn about some of the examples you guys have around customer and use cases, and more likely around the case of how do you measure the impact of AI in the organization? It's always uh, very hard to justify. We are specifically an AI company that is working with industry for entrepreneur across different sectors, and it's always interesting to understand the impact of what you're doing. You know, at the end of the day, the business are looking for results. They want to understand, uh, you know, what you do behind the scene is very interesting. You call it AI today, you call it machine learning, you use your neural networks, you use many different capabilities. At the end of the day, what is the impact on the business? How do you measure 
you know, this kind of innovation and translate it into business results across different segments. Yeah, I can start. Um, I, yeah. I think you met, you mentioned the dynamic process control. I, it's one of my you know favorite uses is just because I think it's it's tangible and you can isolate a use case where something like you know prescriptive uh, parameter control that ensures quality you know on a on a given plant. We have a customer that's a you know a tire manufacturer, but they you know predict when a, a certain type of quality issue is going to happen, and we adjust you know automatically can adjust the the controls you know through a long time implementation and trust in all of this. But at the end of the day, for them, it's more tires made, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it's a it's an easy ROI to calculate. But I think in general, I would say ROI is often misunderstood in AI in general. Right. Um, and if you go outside of an isolated use case, right, one, you have to go back in manufacturing to the theory of constraints, right? You can optimize, you know, the heck out of an individual process, but if you don't have the right, you know, inventory and you don't have the right demand, it, it doesn't really matter anyway in the overall scheme of things, right? So optimizing against, you know, a bottleneck or a constraint is always best in the aggregate, right? Where that individual use case has an impact that can be driven throughout the entire, you know, system. Um, and then ultimately, there's a ton of value in failures and AI implementation. So don't overestimate, you know, or underestimate the value of failing at AI, right? Because that teaches people a lot it's about what it process. means, how to trust yeah. those insights. Yeah. Yes, yes. Correct. Any other thoughts on the panel on this? Uh, so uh, I, I can take a shot, uh, yes. Mikhail, in case you want to go first. Uh, no, please go. So, uh, see, I... I think one of the uh, most interesting uh, developments that at least I am seeing uh, in the way AI is being used. See, we have a very, uh, I mean, when you look at, uh, when you look at manufacturing itself, right, it was mm -hmm. uh, always based on the notion of uh, standardized work, right? That, uh, uh, you know, work is going to be standardized. So therefore, uh, what you do is you try and make machines as smarter as possible, right? But uh, I think that in, in in today's world, where the uh, you know where uh, the entire world of manufacturing is probably going to move to an era of what you know uh, I could call mass uh, customization, right? Where uh, uh, you're going to manufacture in smaller and smaller uh, batches, and uh, you know ultimately hit a segment of one. So the question is that does that approach to uh, you know making machines smarter uh, still hold? And I, I think there. Uh, gives that question itself gives us the possibility that we have to start optimizing interactions, right? We have to start mm -hmm. op optimizing points where when machines and humans and processes come together. And one of the most uh, exciting applications of AI, therefore, to me is, see, we traditionally, uh, you know, have looked at, uh, you know, type one, type two uh, errors. We have looked at, uh, you know, uh, the effect that AI has on machine uptimes and therefore business downtimes. But there is another aspect of AI, which is simulability of uh, the entire enterprise, right? Uh, simulability mm -hmm. of a manufacturing environment. Because this is not about failure. It is about mm -hmm. simulating uh, what the system response would be to a set of inputs which you haven't seen. And I think that is very, very important when we consider this whole resiliency and adaptability era that we are going through. And uh, I think that is another, uh, you know, that is another value driver of AI, which is commonly overlooked that today you have the ability to combine database models and physics based models to actually create simulable representations of the enterprise yeah. and to run your scenarios on those simulable models, therefore saving millions of dollars. Uh, if you try to hot rod, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> hot rod, uh, you know, a live uh, plant. Uh, so that, again, is is uh, another value of AI, which uh, I would like to bring to the fore. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I can jump on that, because yes. for me, in the process, for industry process or manufacturing, there is a big difference between the consumer AI and the industrial AI. Mm -hmm. In consumer industry, you have plenty of samples in the industrial AI, I would say, we only have a sort of outlays where we're looking for and everything looks fine, 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 nothing happened, plenty of data where you cannot really utilize. And then some, suddenly you find something that is a golden nugget and then you want to understand why that happened or you have a failure and it's really the outlier. 
but in principle, in the industry, we have very good control over the physics. We understand mm -hmm. the physics behavior and combining, as you said, the physics behavior and AI, that makes the difference. And there, I think we can really lift it because we can find the things that we could not do directly with the physics. We can start to optimize the plant, for example, make it more flexible and things like that we are doing, but it's sort of hidden behind the scene. And that's part of you are utilizing that kind of competence. And here's one example, lifetime estimation, mm -hmm. where it's extremely difficult from a physics to do it from a basic physical understanding where you can use like machine learning. Mm -hmm. Or one other thing where I think where AI really make the things off where you can see where you can make the big step is the planning already in the planning process. Mm -hmm. Because it's a lot of things that you can reutilize and things like that. And for sure you can lift the operation. But I, I think it's a lot of things and it's happening everywhere. And most people doesn't realize that is what I said earlier. Just a tool that we start yep. to implement. Yeah. It's not the goal. And manufacturing. Sorry. Correct. Yeah, yeah, it's not the goal. It's just the tool in the process itself. And we see it on a, on a variety of different cases on malfunction prediction, dealing with, with heavy machinery, you know, across different industries, from mining to power plants, um, all over the place. And the question basically comes to, um, to Christian. What are the pre prerequisites, you know, on implementing kind of uh, um, an AI project successfully and what you're seeing across different segments that you're dealing with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably let me first come back to, to, to the question before that. So sure. um, I, I, I agree it's, it's just a tool, um, but I think it will have a massive impact on society, even in the industrial world, because it helps you to uh, relieve frontline workers from day-to-day -day tasks and it helps them to focus on really those incidents uh, uh, where we need human support. And um, from what I can tell, from what I see in the industry, this is becoming much more important in the future. So we have the the aging population. Yeah, there are probably in the future less people who can do the job. Then uh, with the supply chain disruptions and the discussions we have around nearshoring, we see that uh, probably... Uh, We'll, we, will, we will have a, a shortage on labor in the future, which will even add to that. And that's an interesting development because with the help of AI, uh, labor costs is probably not the crucial factor uh, in, in the future anymore. So meaning we can shift operations back to high wage countries um, and, and use AI to, to support that strategy. And that, mm -hmm. that's for me one, one really um, an interesting uh, aspect. Now, coming back uh, to your question on what are the prerequisites in order to do that. Um, yeah, good question. Um, so for, from the examples that I know, it, they are mostly in, in, in process and, and food industry. Yeah. Um, it's having a, a good understanding of um, the parameters the influencing parameters mm -hmm. uh, on the process uh, and then closing the entire control loop back to the system. So it's about having the right sensors to, so to say, understand what, what's going on in real time and, and then having, on the other hand, the actuator that helps you to, to influence uh, the things that you're seeing here. And that's, um, that's a pretty interesting. So um, the, the ingredients we see uh, um, tend to be a strong backbone uh, so having a place where you can orchestrate your data, um, for example, an IoT platform, uh, having uh, the, the right standards in terms of APIs or interfaces and how mm -hmm. you can connect to that, and then having the right analytics tools and engines that, that can si sit on top of your IoT platform that help you with actually analyzing those information and feeding it there. So where, where are we uh, in, in terms of the broader industry? Uh, I think many organizations have started to introduce um, IIoT platforms. Um, from what I can tell, uh, that uh, is that um, we have those use cases where AI is running a lot, but um, when you look at the broad industry, I don't think we are there yet. Yeah? So there's mm -hmm. still a lot of work to do, massive investments necessary to really uh, connect the things and, and, and getting them going so that you, that you start to have access to real-time data to actually apply AI. Yeah? So that's mm -hmm. at least... Chris, do you want to comment on this? 
Yeah, I think, I think you're exactly right. And I think a lot of times an AI strategy is sort of um, overemphasized when really it comes down to a data strategy, right? You, yeah. Does the company understand the value of their data, right? Do executives understand or are willing to learn what it means to ask a question of data, how to frame analytics questions, right? And is the culture of the company, you know, uh, gone beyond sort of this separation of OT and IT? Is there is there more of an OT IT convergence? Is the if you ask a you know manufacturing executive, does he know who to go to when you say, yeah, I want to see your historian data, or I want to, you know, just that that ability to understand the value where that data lives and what it can mean to to optimize uh, an operation makes it a heck of a lot. AI is a lot easier when you have a data strategy. <laughs> Mikael, you want to comment on this one? I, I think I always want to build on what you said. I think one of the biggest issue in a company is to connect the data science with the people with the domain knowledge, because they are not often the same people, and mm. they are normally often sitting in different departments and don't speak the same language. So if you connect them, I think you can really do a difference and really utilizing the AI, especially in the industry. And I, mm. think, I think that's one of the bigger things. Yes. So is it about um, moving from big data to the right data? Because it appears like there is tons of data all over the place and different <laughs> sensor capability. But so no, it's not only about putting sensors and getting more data. It's about finding the right data within it and start doing some real work and working on this one. Sanko, what are your thoughts on this? So um, I, I'll share, a, you know, about five years back, everybody was on and on about big data, right? And yeah. uh, um, there is this, um, you know, the, the, there's something called KD Nuggets, which is essentially, uh, you know, uh, practitioners of data science. And I, I remember about 2016, they had run a, 2016 or 17, they had run a survey. Uh, mm. And they had asked that, what is the largest size database that you want to do data science on? And, uh, you know, uh, we thought the answer would be terabytes, but, uh, you know, uh, sorry to disappoint everybody, it wasn't gigabytes. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so, so again, you know, coming back to what Chris said, there really, uh, you know, very few organizations have big, big data, right? Uh, uh, most of them are data starved. Uh, uh, they they struggle with data, and it's it's just not a case of having data, right? About, you know, the entire transformation process of the data to get it ready for AI. Uh, that's a very expensive process, uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, a, a simple thing like uh, labeling, right, is, is very, yes. very expensive when you're dealing with, uh, uh, you know, tons of data to build a simple classifier. And I think there, uh, you know, there are a lot of strategies, uh, especially in TCS, uh, for example, about four years back, we had built an internal uh, data labeling uh, platform uh, where, uh, you know, where uh, you could actually farm out data labeling tasks. So we are a large company, we're about 500,000 people. So you could actually farm out data lab labeling yeah. tasks, gamify it, and uh, you know get some of your data sorted that way, right? Uh, the the other couple of points um, uh, about uh, the data question is, see, when it comes to uh, especially uh, industrial AI, uh, I think there is a real paucity of failure data, right? Uh, uh, we right, and and that's a huge huge problem that the industry grapples with, and you know there are a few techniques. Uh, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that are being used to sort of get over it. You know, you use LSTMs to generate uh, synthetic data uh, for, you know, time series data and then try to, uh, you know, train models on that. But, uh, you know, uh, 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 there's, there's really, you know, failure data which is missing. And uh, just a couple of other points that I would like to mention is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Christian, you spoke about uh, the sensor deployment, right? And uh, see, one of the common problems that we see is that 80% of the, uh, industrial equipment is actually brownfield equipment, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And many of them, uh, you know, you, you can't open them up and install sensors, uh, either because uh, the protocols uh, are not open, uh, or uh, secondly, you might actually lose insurance <laughs> on that equipment. <laughs> right? so, uh, so I think there is also, a, uh, you know, a, a large space for what I call unobtrusive sensing uh, mm -hmm. to close the data gap that you have in brownfield uh, uh, you know, brownfield uh, uh, deployments. Uh, and, uh, you know, then there you have to deal yeah. with a host of other problems, right? Yeah, that you have heavily metalled environments. How do you get a signal uh, across? Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, so there are there are a lot of actually uh, physics and science issues yes. uh, to be solved there as well. So, yeah. 
Chris, do you want to comment? Couple, on this? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I could. I wouldn't be a PTC citizen if I didn't mention the power of Kepware when it comes to brownfield equipment, but <laughs> <laughs> for protocol translation. But yeah. uh, the I think uh, the the notion of domain experts, data scientists, and sort of people who understand data and IT is is absolutely critical. And the, again, I think most companies, you're right, they're data starved. And let's be honest, there's not great sensors for failure, right? So sometimes. Be, you have to one understand what failure really means, but also be creative about what that is, right? Are you are you running calculations and rules because you are trying to be, you know, in a heuristic sense, preventative of failure, and then using that as an outcome variable in the case of supervised machine learning, for instance, right? But also the the case of all of this data, don't make the good news of the industrial space being a bit of a laggard here when it comes to data and AI is they can learn from the lessons of other companies, right? So before you get into this massive data ecosystem right understand the importance of the right data right not all data is right. created equal more data is not always better often it is yes but um you have to be able to understand where you need that data from and i i remember years ago when i first joined ptc going into a, a manufacturing customer in japan they had spent millions of dollars on sensorization of this of this entire plan and process a absolutely impressive but they still couldn't get to predict the maintenance issue that they wanted to predict. And my, the data scientist was with me. The first question after hours of meetings with executives was, can I just talk to the most experienced operator? Like, can, who is the guy who's been here forever, right? And on this plan, let me just follow mm -hmm. him for an afternoon. And he followed him and he watched him and he listens for something when he's fixing this critical bottleneck right. asset. So what they needed was a microphone, not millions of dollars of sensors. And they could have saved a lot of money by just listening <laughs> to their domain <laughs> That's perfect. Um, Christian, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, I mean, it's, it's, that's a super example. Yeah, so it's, it's very important to, to, to listen to those operators who are the most experienced. And we, we, we learn that as well. Yeah, so in, in that case, uh, often even a simple first principle model can, can help. Yeah, and, and can yeah. make a difference. Um, but I find interesting that even in industry, um, um, Probably uh, the a manufacturing environment is not uh, the place number one where you would want to deploy AI. So there are much, much easier fields like in sales or supply chain and so on. So this is at least the, the, the feeling mm -hmm. I have uh, and what, what I see when talking to our clients. And the reason to that is uh, um, it quite in line with that what Sanka said. So it's difficult, it's complex to, to add sensors. Uh, but secondly, uh, the opportunities to scale is not really there because you are in a brownfield environment and each site or plant that you have within your production network might look different. Yeah? So you're going through that learning phase over and over again and there, there's hardly any chance to reuse the things you just did in the first plant. Yes, absolutely. I can tell you from, from my experience in one of the cases of predictive maintenance, the change on AI is not necessarily just a technology part, which is, let's say, is, is very durable. Uh, and we're capable, it's the change on the field itself. When we're dealing with some of the largest mines in the world and you uh, lift up you know, a, a specific concern about a specific malfunction, people have to go down, put down their gear, go up, go climb the reclaimer, look at this one, listen to the same machine he was listening for 20 years and say, you know, I trust you AI. So it's not only about building the technology, but building the trust within the team itself that what you're doing is the right thing and it's not just about how do you proactively, yeah. you know, just uh, predict the future uh, based on anomaly yeah. detection that you've invented? I always think too, industrial companies want to start with predictive maintenance too. There's other, th there's plenty of other things to predict too because there might not be a failure for that equipment. Correct. Understanding and predicting yeah. quality gives you a lot more data and you know sources to understand. It's much more generalizable in the industrials. Right. Absolutely. And, and the point that Michael made, I think that also is very important. That uh, optimization, right? Uh, right. Uh, where do you put your, you know, where do you put your machine? Where do you put your people? Uh, how do you plan batches? Right. So that also is a, you know, a often neglected uh, or rather overlooked part of AI deployment in an industrial setup. And I think mm -hmm. that was a very important point, Michael brought up. Fantastic. Uh, I think we we need to address also one thing is actually. Mm -hmm. When we're coming in the industry, they normally want to have a system that sits there for 10, 20 years. They don't want to change it. And then you come around with software where you normally have a much shorter life cycle on. So we need to see the life cycle management of the AI that we implement 
So it really fits into industrial world. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things where a lot of customers asking, okay, what happened now if you are changing the whole platform again after some years? Correct. Mikhail, I'll continue with this one. What do you think about the risks element and the regulation around uh, artificial intelligence in this specific industry? Are there any risks and limitations uh, for using AI It's part of this kind of industrial uh, revolution? Uh, I think we've been into it quite a lot. I think one of those is for sure the business model. The business model needs to be scalable, as we mentioned before. If it's yes. not scalable, it will not fly. Then we are selling a lot of engineering hours for people that are adapting AI to that industry. Nice for the consulting business, but perhaps not that nice for a customer. Uh, but I think we also mentioned is actually the data, the access to the right data for sure, and the trustworthiness of this. Mm-hmm. And especially if you start to deal with critical part of, an, uh, of a plant, then they really want to be secure. You cannot mess around and say, sorry, this uh, didn't work out really well with this AI this time, but next time we will have a brilliant solution. So mm. I, I think that is really robustness. I think that's okay. really important. Sanka, any thoughts on this? Yeah, so um, see, I think, uh, uh, see when it, so there's this whole talk about responsible AI and I was just trying to yeah. sort of interpret what it would mean for um, for the industrial world, right? Because in the consumer world, uh, there is uh, obviously, you know, you know, privacy is a huge issue, right? The the way you uh, uh, treat data or normalize data for privacy. But when it comes to responsible AI for industrial, I think uh, there are uh, three key elements. Uh, I think uh, uh, ethics, right, or ethical treatment uh, of people, uh, of partners. Uh, which is, you know, uh, you know, treatment which is uh, value-based, principles-based, and which is fair and transparent, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, we have to really interpret it for the industrial world, but uh, I'm sure that there are going to be some issues uh, around that, right? Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, it could be simply about, uh, you know, uh, how you do shifts, how you compensate people, mm-hmm. uh, who do you promote, who do you demote based on, uh, you know, based on some... AI system sort of judging their performance, right? Uh, and these kind of issues are starting to come up in, right. uh, you know, in the retail industry, for example, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, and take and, and you can see, uh, I think you can see, Sanka, you can see the impact also around um, safety, right? Autonomous right. vehicle using AI, you can see right. it across, uh, you know, right. mine operation. You, you start using AI and give it more responsibility. I think the impact of mm-hmm. this will be significantly larger because it's going to be kind of a hands-on operation. Right. I want to finish with one question for all of you and, Kind of, uh, kind of a one sentence from each or a thought uh, as we're almost running out of time. But I'm always interested in, in, in learning kind of what do you see as the most promising, exciting opportunities of AI, you know, in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, I'll hold you accountable and we'll meet here again in, in 10 years just to verify that you're correct. But, you know, one sentence that, that summarizes kind of your thoughts around this one um, and figuring this one out. We'll start with Christian, if you don't mind. Yeah, so for, for me, AI actually can can be a game changer, yeah? So it, it can help mm-hmm. this very traditional manufacturing industry to transform itself. Um, I think we'll see a lot in this field of nearshoring, shifting geographical boundaries um, done with the help of AI because we can start to automate uh, things uh, which couldn't be automated in the past, yeah? And the factor of, of labor costs is probably yep. not that important in the future anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I think mine's, mine's going to be pretty simple and it can be done today, uh, but I think it will take a lot of organizational change and focus on data. But I, I imagine a world where, um, you know, manufacturers and, and operators are always going to be thinking proactively and probabilistically about resolving issues that the days of, of reactive uh, maintenance and reactive approaches to addressing quality um, you know, will be gone, that everyone will be speaking about in probabilistic terms about something that may happen in the future with, with a degree of confidence. And on the other side in service, I would say enabling, um, you know, product as a service models. I think yeah. the, the connectivity and the insight into this uh, will start to see a shift. We've been waiting for it, but yeah. where companies are selling industrial equipment as a service. It's coming. Sanka? 
So I'll go on a limb and I'll take inspiration from what is happening uh, in the area of decentralized autonomous organization DAOs, right? And what's happening uh, with the metaverse phenomenon. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll I'll go on a limb and I'll say that uh, maybe the you know about a decade uh, into the future, uh, you know, you will have fat protocols and uh, thin applications in, in manufacturing shops. Uh, and I, I see a very exciting future where uh, hopefully. Uh, intelligence, mm -hmm. commerce, and experience, operator experience will finally come together uh, for the industrial sector. Uh, so now this, at the moment, these are very different things. So, Thank you very much. Um, Mikhail, your thoughts? Yeah, okay. Thanks. Uh, I, I think we have to look a little bit broader. It's 10, 20 years ahead. So I hope that AI actually we will utilize the whole life cycle of the product. Mm -hmm. from the uh, design, commissioning, maintenance, and reuse of the material. And I hope that we can utilize AI to reduce the CO2 footprint to a minimum. So we really can work as not only as deliver and producing as much as possible, but saving the world actually in the same way. That's what I would like to see. Fantastic. Gentlemen, um, this was a, an amazing opportunity to speak with some of the brightest minds in the industry. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here. Thank you for your thoughts and openness. I really appreciate it. Um, and we wish you all the best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much.